And here we discover something important also about the whole egalitarian program. It's not really about equality. It's about some people exercising power over others. At the University of Tennessee this fall, the Office for Diversity and Inclusion explained that traditional English pronoun pronouns are oppressive to people who do not identify with the gender they were, quote, assigned at birth. And so ought to be replaced with something new. The diversity office recommends as replacements for she, her, hers, he, him, his, the following, she, here, hers, here's, z, zer, zers, z, zem, and zir. When approaching people for the first time, students were told, we should say something like, like nice to meet you. What pronouns should I use? <laughs> so when the whole world burst out laughing at this proposal, the university was at pains to assure everyone these, of course, were just suggestions. Already, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course, we're not our suggestions are the thoughts that all right-thinking people are expected to have about moral questions that have been decided for us by our media and political elites. Another aspect of equality that's been in the news in recent years is, of course, income inequality. We're told how terrible it is that some people should have so much more than others. But rarely, if ever, how we told how much of any extra wealth the egalitarian society would allow the better off to have, or the non-arbitrary basis on which such a judgment could be rendered. John Rawls was possibly the most influential political philosopher of the 20th century, a terrible century. And he advanced a famous defense of egalitarianism in his book, A Theory of Justice. He attempted to answer this question among others. If I may summarize his argument in brief, he claimed that we would all choose an egalitarian society if, as we contemplated the values of society, the ones that we'd want to live under, we had no idea what our own position in that society would be. If we didn't know if we were to be male or female, rich or poor, talented or untalented, or we would hedge our bets by advocating a society in which everyone was as equal as possible. That way, should we be, be unlucky and enter the world without talents or as a member of a despised minority or saddled with any other disability, we could still be assured of a comfortable, if not luxurious, existence. Rawls was willing to allow some degree of inequality, but only if its effect was to help the poor. In other words, doctors could be allowed to earn more money than other people if that financial incentive made them more likely to become doctors in the first place. If incomes are equalized, people would be less likely to go to the trouble of becoming a doctor, and the poor would be deprived of medical care. So inequality could be allowed, but only on egalitarian grounds, not because people have the right to acquire and enjoy property without fear of expropriation. Since no one in his right mind accepts full-blown egalitarianism, Rawls was bound to run into trouble. The trouble came in the form of attempts to deal with equality between countries. Even the most dedicated egalitarian living in the first world doesn't want equal equalization of wealth between countries. College professors who teach the moral superiority of egalitarianism during the day want their fine wine and cheese parties in their beautiful homes at night. So Rawls came up with a, uh, with a strained and unpersuasive argument that although inequality between persons was outrageous and could be justified only on the basis of whether it helped the poorest, inequality between countries was quite all right. He then proceeded to give reasons, even though these were the exact reasons he had said that inequality between individuals was unacceptable. Even if egalitarianism could be defended philosophically, there is the small matter of implementing it in the real world. Just one reason the egalitarian dream cannot be realized involves what Robert Nozick called the Wilt Chamberlain problem. James Otteson has called this something like the day two problem. In Chamberlain's heyday, everyone enjoyed watching him play basketball. People gladly paid to watch him play. But suppose we gave with an equal distribution of wealth and then everyone rushes out to watch Chamberlain Many thousands of people would willingly hand over a portion of their money to him to watch him play basketball, and he now becomes much wealthier than everyone else. In other words, the pattern of wealth distribution is disturbed as soon as anyone engages in exchange at all. 
Are we to cancel the results of these exchanges and return everyone's money to the original owners? Is Chamberlain to be deprived of the money people freely chose to give him in exchange for the entertainment he provided? But the reason the state holds up equality as a moral ideal is precisely that it is unattainable. We may forever strive for it, but we can never reach it. What ideology could be better from the state's point of view? The state can portray itself as the indispensable agent of justice, while at the same time drawing ever more power and resources to itself over education, employment, wealth redistribution, and practically any area of social life or the economy you can name, in the course of pursuing an unattainable egalitarian program. Quote, equality cannot be imagined outside of tyranny, Montel Lambert said. It was, he said, nothing but the canonization of envy. It was never anything but a mask which could become reality, which could not become reality, without the abolition of all merit and virtue. In the course of working towards equality, the state expands its power at the expense of other forms of human association, including the family itself. The family has always been the primary obstacle to the egalitarian program. The very fact that parents differ in their knowledge, skill levels, and devotion to their offspring means that children in no two households can never be raised equally. Robert Nisbet, the Columbia University sociologist, openly wondered if Rawls could be honest enough to admit that his system, if followed to its logical conclusion, had to lead to the abolition of the family. Quote, said Nisbet, I have always found treatment of the family to be an excellent indicator of the degree of zeal and authoritarianism, overt or latent, in a moral philosopher or political theorist. Nisbet said he identified two traditions of thought in Western history, one he traced from Plato to Rousseau, that identified the family as a wicked barrier to the realization of true virtue and justice. The other, which, he, which viewed the family as a central ingredient in both liberty and order, he followed from Aristotle through Burke and Tocqueville. Rawls himself appeared to admit the logic of this argument, that the logic of his argument tended in the direction of the Plato-Rousseau strain of thought, though he ultimately and unpersuasively drew back. Here are Rawls' own words. It seems that when fair opportunity, as, as, as it has been defined, is satisfied, the family will lead to unequal chances between individuals. Is the family to be abolished then? Taken by itself and given a certain primacy, the idea of equal opportunity inclines in this direction. But within the context of the theory of justice as a whole, there is much less urgency to take this course. Nisbet took a little comfort in Rawls's pathetic assurances. Can Rawls, he wondered, long neglect the family, given its demonstrated relation to an inequality? Rousseau was bold and constant enough where Rawls is diffident. If the young are to be brought up in the bosom of equality, quote, early accustomed to regard their own individual, individuality only in relation to the body of the state, to be aware, so to speak, of their own existence merely as part of that of the state, unquote, then they must be safe when Rousseau refers to as, quote, the intelligence and prejudices of fathers. The obsession with equality, in, in short, undermines every indication of health we might look for in a civilization. It involves madness to complete, so complete that although it flirts with the destruction of the family, it never stops to consider whether this conclusion might mean the whole line of thought may have been deranged to begin with. It leads to the destruction of standards, scholarly, cultural, and behavioral. It is based on, the, on assertion rather than evidence, and it attempts to gain ground not through rational argument, but by intimidating opponents into silence. There is nothing honorable or admirable about any aspect of the egalitarian program. Murray noted that pointing out the lunacy of egalitarianism was a good start, but not nearly enough. We need to show that the so-called struggle for equality is in fact all about state power. Not helping the downtrodden, he wrote, to mount an effective response to the reigning egalitarianism of our age, therefore, it is necessary but scarcely sufficient to demonstrate its absurdity, the anti-scientific nature, the self-contradictory nature of the egalitarian doctrine, as well as the disastrous consequences of the egalitarian program. 
All this is well and good. But it misses the essential nation of, as well as the most effective rebuttal to, the egalitarian program. To expose it as a mask for the drive to power of the now ruling left liberal intellectual and media elites. Since these elites are also the hitherto unchallenged opinion molding class in society, their rule cannot be dislodged, dislodged until the oppressed public, instinctively but inchoately opposed to these elites, are shown the true nature of the increasingly hated forces who are ruling over them. To use the paraphrase, to use the phrases of the new left, Murray said of the late 1960s, the ruling elite must be demystified, delegitimized, and desanctified. Nothing can advance that desanctification more than the public realization of the true nature of their egalitarian slogans.